The scripture reading today is from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Philippians is a real letter, written correspondence from Paul to a small group of Christians he knew very well. Like several other parts of the New Testament, when we read Philippians, we are quite literally reading from someone else's mail. Although Paul had founded the church in Philippi and spent 18 months teaching them, the group of Christians there still had some basic questions about Jesus and what it means to be Jesus' follower. Who is Jesus? How is he related to God? What authority does Jesus have? They had questions like these and more. In the passage we hear today, Paul quotes for them a hymn that was apparently used in the very earliest gatherings of Christian worship. It might not sound like a hymn to us, but in the original Greek, it sounds more like something the people could actually sing together, although we don't know what that tune was, of course. So, from the second chapter of Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any communion of spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be one of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, and the hymn starts here, by the way, though he was in the form of God, did not, re did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that a name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to glory of God the Father. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God, God of these, these words, words of life. life. Let us pray. Most blessed God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the witness of those who were a lot closer to Jesus Christ than we were, we are. We thank you that the church has given us the gift of this connection through history, through scripture. We pray that as we think through today some of the implications of the story of Jesus Christ and Paul's words about him, that you will give us your spirit, that you will give us your peace, so that we may hear your words as an encouragement, as a way forward, as a way of life. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a friend, a local pastor who serves a church not far away from here, who decided recently to leave his church after 11 years there. He's a little older than me, which you might surmise means that he was actually planning on retiring from that congregation that he's served for the last few years, not planning to leave it and go elsewhere to serve. But beginning about five years ago, and then dramatically in the last two years of the pandemic, things became increasingly difficult for him. While I was saying, while I would say that he was still doing good work in the congregation, that good work just got harder. 
the diversity of the congregation turned into differences. Differences turned into disagreements. Disagreements turned into arguments. Arguments turned into battles. And although there are rarely any winners in such situations, just to make a point, let me say that even if you win most of them, battles are no fun. As he tells the story, maybe five or ten percent of the congregation simply made life and ministry unpleasant for him. Really, though, I guess unpleasant is not the right word. You, a healthy pastor doesn't expect pleasantness. But let's say they made life and ministry unsatisfying for him. And I could tell that story with minor variations about a dozen other pastors that I know. Pastors are leaving churches in huge numbers these days. And although there are a variety of different reasons and, you know, it plays out differently everywhere, a common thread of many of their stories is that the last five years have been the hardest, most unsatisfying times of their ministry. Now, you may have noticed the word with which I began my pastor friends slide down into battles. It was diversity. The diversity of the congregation turned to differences, differences to disagreements, and downward things went. Diversity has become difficult for us all in so many ways, in churches, in communities, in national and global politics, geez, even in our families, right? Even if we value diversity, it still become more difficult. In some ways, this is good, I believe. The problematizing. There's a neologism for you, right? Turning problem into I don't know, a verb, I guess it is. The problematizing of diversity in these days started as a healthy attempt to ungloss a lot of things that had been glossed over with very vivid examples of injustice happening in our society, black and brown people began a few years ago a new era of giving powerful voice to ways that a celebration of diversity was superficial. Like the Old Testament prophets who cried, peace, peace, when there was no peace. What many people meant by diversity was more like a melting pot than a tossed salad. To celebrate diversity is not just to recognize the common humanity of all, but to value and honor the ways that we are different, to undo the injustices that marginalize some types of difference. And at the heart of all of that is to decenter the experience of whiteness in all its forms. What am I saying? How many of you have been to the small world ride at either Disneyland or Disney World? All right. So at least I got a lot of you who understand what I'm going to be talking about here. So, on the Small World ride at Disney, I've never been to Disneyland, but at the Small World ride at Disney, I think it's the same. On the Small World ride at Disney World, you float along in your little boat past a beautiful assortment of world cultures. Swedish, Polynesian, 
Nigerian. Well, actually, they kind of like melt all of sub-Saharan Africa together into one imaginary culture. But anyway, Chinese, American, Arab, little stereotypical, maybe even caricatures, features of the world's cultures are presented in full, living color. It's a beautiful celebration, really, of the world's diversity. As the background music plays, it's a small world after all, it's a small world after on and on, over and over, you see laid before you what a big world it actually is. And then, at the end, something interesting happens. In the final area of the ride, when they try to show why the big, diverse world that you have just seen is actually a small world after all, they turn the whole thing white. I'm sure they were aiming, I don't know, back in probably, what, 1973 when this thing was created? I'm sure they were aiming for harmonious, but maybe a few years ago, um, it seems like today, not so much harmonious as homogenous. And that's an important difference. The diversity disappears into this bland and not very honest similarity or even uniformity. What I have learned through the years from the LGBTQ pride movement, from Black Lives Matter, from having a Chinese daughter-in-law, and from my good friend Reverend MoMA, and from all my connection to Angola, is that it's not a small world after all. It's a big, beautiful, diverse world, and often an unjust world. And I am a better person and a better follower of Christ because of LGBTQ pride and Black Lives Matter and my personal experience has unglossed so much of what used to be glossed over. One of my seminary professors, Stanley Hauerwas, once wrote, love, love, is the nonviolent embrace of the other as other. Love is the nonviolent embrace of the other as other. There is very little else we need to learn about all of this. Other people are other. They are not simply characters in my story. They are the protagonists of their own lives, their own stories. And in truth, that doesn't separate me from them. Rather, it is the only thing that makes a real relationship possible. The only thing that makes love possible. Now, just to be clear, I want to preface this next section of my sermon by saying that I have no real opinion about the overall job performance of the superintendent of School District 86. Before three weeks ago, I couldn't have told you the name of the superintendent. Some people I respect seem to trust her. Some people I respect want to get rid of her. What follows is not a statement about District 86 leadership. End of parentheses. But what I do want to ask is why this issue of her performance has blown up 
specifically around the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Or more broadly, why is this subject so hard? I think it comes down to the small world ride, really. What we accepted for a long time in our society, pretty naively, and while glossing over a lot of things, was a vision of diversity that was largely based in the goal of homogeneity. We certainly didn't think that's what we were doing. We probably didn't even want that to be what we were doing. But the force of cultural momentum continually pushed in that direction. In the end, we all come out the same. And same is easy. Same is comfortable. But when we learn to non-violently embrace the other as other, then we're really getting somewhere. Because if we embrace people as the protagonist of their own story, then we have to value that story just as much as our own. We have to respect their experiences just as much as our own. We have to honor their suffering just as much as our own. Love your neighbor as yourself means love the other as the other, allowing them to remain other. In the school district, there's a lot of listening that needs to be done. If we're truly going to embrace each other as other, with a diversity of gifts and beauty and injustices suffered, then we need to listen and ungloss a lot of things that have been glossed over. Such work isn't a burden. It's not a chore, but it's a gift. It's the creation of true diversity, true equity, and true inclusion. Now, I really didn't leave enough time for this, uh, especially with several other things going on in the service, but I, I put a reference to the Holy Trinity in my sermon today because the nonviolent embrace of the other as other is not some addition to or implication of our faith. Rather, it is at the very heart of the nature of God. God is one in three, three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three persons, the traditional word that's been used in the theology of the church, these three persons of the Trinity are different and yet one. The Father delights in the Son. The Son rejoices in the Father. The Holy Spirit basks in the Son. The Son loves the Spirit. Without losing the identity of each one, they are yet inseparably together. That doctrine is at the very core of our vision for this life. That doctrine is at the very core of this vision for healthy communities. That doctrine is at the very core of faithful Christianity. To see the other as other and embrace it as other. And to join in the dance of the three, 
that make one, the one that make three together. If that can be our vision of community together, then we have a chance to make our families and our church and our communities and even our world the place that God desires for it to be. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Amen.